Vera Gorbanova is a professor of biology at the University of Rochester and co-director of the Rochester Aging Research Center. Her research is focused on understanding the mechanisms of longevity and genome stability and on the studies of exceptionally long-lived mammals. Dr. Gorbanova pioneered the comparative biology approach to study aging and identified rules that control the evolution of tumor suppressor mechanisms depending on the species lifespan and body mass. Her work received awards from the Ellison Medical Foundation, the Glenn Foundation, American Federation of Aging Research and from the National Institute of Health. With that, let me start the interview. So, uh, Dr. Gorbanova, welcome to Modern Healthspan and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So, Dr. Gorbanova, you run a lab at the University of Rochester where you study uh, aging and DNA repair and cancer. So, can you give us some background as to why did you decide to study aging? Well, it just seems to me that one of the most fascinating problems of biology and medicine and society, uh, because uh, science has found cures for many diseases, but aging really is the one that remains. Uh, and aging is an underlying cause of many diseases. So I felt that uh, that is just a very important question to study. And then biologically, it is such a complex problem. So <laughs> I wanted to tackle it. Right. So you focus on like comparative biology, I believe, right? So comparing mm -hmm. the, the, the ages of different, well, the maximum lifespan of different animals. So why did you pick that kind of way to study aging? Yeah, so my approach is to um, study animals short-lived and long-lived and to find mm -hmm. out the mechanisms uh, that allow for longevity and that naturally evolved to allow for longevity. And I think this is an extremely promising and productive direction uh, because in the early stages of aging research, there was um, a very big focus on short-lived organisms because people were looking for some conserved pathways that work the same uh, mm. in every species. But the problem with that is that, yes, a few pathways were identified, but it's still not clear whether manipulating those pathways can actually extend human lifespan because humans are already very long-lived. And the we may already have optimized those conserved mechanisms. So maybe there is limited room for improvement. And if we just focus on studying short-lived organisms, they may not have those unique adaptations uh, that we need for longevity. So this is more like looking for your keys on the street light because it's easier instead of looking where you actually lost it. Uh, and that's really where the key can be is in naturally long-lived animals. Uh, and it's very rewarding when we study something like naked mole rat, we find new things, mm. completely new. And um, then some of those mechanisms can be applied to humans. Right. So I hadn't thought about that before, but so that could be, so, so do you think that is part of the reason why um, like some of these interventions will add 10 or 20% to a mouse, but then when applied to a human, it, it may have no effect or a very small effect. Yes, you're absolutely right. With short-lived organisms, it may be you know, easier in some ways uh, because let's say take, if you take a mouse or a fruit fly, uh, their lifestyle is focused on optimizing reproduction and they live very fast. Uh, mm. and then reproduce fast, and then they age fast. Right. And so just slowing them down a little bit confers some lifespan extensions. But we humans, uh, we already really optimize our lifespan, and we are not as prolific as those organisms. Uh, so the balance is already different. Uh, that's why it, it's really not clear whether the same interventions that work so beautifully in a fruit fly or in a worm will be applicable to a long-lived uh, human. Right. Yes. No, that's that's very interesting way of thinking about it. Yeah. So, but can I ask, like, a, I guess a more basic question. Um, so why, why do we age? Um, why is it? 
I guess from an evolutionary point of view, uh, why do you think that aging exists? Why not just live forever? <laughs> yes, that, that's a very good question. Um, well, I think aging exists because um, in biology and genetics, uh, it's not really focused so much on lifespan, it's focused on reproduction. So whatever traits uh, an, an animal has that make it pass its genes to the next generation, so those traits will be selected and then the next generation will have those genes that allow them um, to produce offspring and survive. Um, I mean, not so much to survive, but produce viable offspring. Mm. Uh, so now, if you think about it, uh, let's say if organisms were immortal, uh, there is also often some uh, limitation on resources. Mm. So you cannot optimize everything. So, so there are certain choices that are to be made. So let's say if you inc put so much resources into maintaining your body rather than reproducing so that also may be suboptimal because if this is such an immortal being if it doesn't leave progeny well it may eventually die from an accident and <laughs> those mm. genes would be lost uh, so there was some kind of optimization so species live long enough uh, to reproduce uh, and then after that it kind of trails off because you don't need that much maintenance anymore those genes that would allow uh, for example, a mouse to live for 100 years it would be lost because mm. mice can be uh, eaten by cats and uh, foxes and hawks. Uh, so there is really no reason for a mouse to invest in maintaining its body for 100 years. There is no benefit. It's better for it to reproduce very quickly and then like whatever. <laughs> uh, so for a human, maybe the balance was somewhat different because we are large and intelligent animals, so we don't get killed so easily as mice. So that's why we evolved this longer life that allows us also to raise our children that need long you know, parental care. So for every species, there is this optimal balance and it probably very rarely <laughs> towards immortality. There is always some accidental death uh, in nature. So that's why it just doesn't make sense kind of for species to be immortal. Uh, if you yeah. calculate, let's say, what's the chance of a certain organism just dying uh, from out sort of environmental causes of predation. Um, and then that would be factored in on whatever maximum life, lifespan that uh, species have evolved. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So, so it's basically you live until you're old enough to reproduce and then you kind of fall apart. But yes, exactly. So that was the other part of your question, right? What, what aging is, is it, um, you know, kind of falling apart or is it very programmed? Mm. I don't think it's, it's that programmed. Well, there is obviously a genetic program uh, in a sense that, yeah, every species have their own lifespan, like mice live three years and humans live like, <laughs> up to 120, but most of us less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so there is a clear genetic component, but I don't think it is as programmed as development because development happens in a very organized way. Like we know with, especially with an embryo, like there is, there are all these specific stages when different organ systems develop. With aging, it's much less controlled. Uh, so it's probably more kind of falling apart, uh, but organisms fall apart, you know, not like cars, like cars fall apart if you don't, <laughs> if you don't take care of them, there is some wear and tear and things get rusted and fall apart. Mm. Um, in living organisms, there is repair. Uh, so mm. when we are young and we get injured, so then we recover fairly quickly, uh, but then over time, the damage we accumulate um, exceeds our repair capacity or also our repair capacity may start shutting down and that's probably the key to why uh, species have different lifespans uh, because we are programmed uh, to repair to maintain our tissues and organs up to a certain age and then after that those repair mechanisms just start to decline and then there is this process of 
rather unprogrammed for your part, just because there is not sufficient maintenance. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, but the the if you look at the CPG clocks, right, the, 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 those clocks continue to tick. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the the methylation on the CPGs, the epigenetic mm -hmm. clocks, and they go, they continue to tick after they they continue to be predictable after reproduction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there there is some kind of a predictable development that continues, although it, it may not be as um, yeah as predictable as as the the initial development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I am very fascinated by epigenetics and those methylation clocks. I think that is one of the most significant discoveries in biology because we desperately needed biomarkers to measure aging and the CPG methylation really offers that. So Steve Horvath, which, who is my good friend and collaborator, I think he made um, you know, a very seminal discovery by uh, bringing this biomarker to aging field. And of course, we all want to understand the biological uh, meaning of that. Uh, mm. So as you said, yeah, there is this change and the clocks can measure, you know, they can be applied to children, to young people and then people that are older and post-reproductive. But what I think, back to your question, why the clock continues sort of to tick, mm. um, there are different clocks. So aging is very complex. And as we already discussed, there are there are genetic components, there is environmental component, and those CPG um, sites, uh, they reflect many aspects of aging. So there are different clocks, some may be better at just sort of measuring your chronological age, some may, you know, and this is really the clocks we want, so the clocks that would predict mortality and like when mm. you get sick. And so these are all different clocks. So that's why when you say, well, they continue to tick, okay, some part of it will continue, some part may change. Uh, so I think we still, we don't really understand all those components, but uh, from my discussions with Steve Horwitz, there are different clocks for different purposes that probably capture uh, subsets mm -hmm. of those CPGs that are responsible for these different processes that take place as we age. Right. Yes, thank you. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.